in the last class uh, you know we had just stopped uh, with the slide on the periodic table of materials and I had mentioned that uh, if you were to ask somebody maybe 10 years ago uh, you know what are the ingredients of the silicon chip you would uh, probably see just a handful of materials as is indicated here. Silicon of course uh, is a group 4 semiconductor and in addition uh, you would need uh, arsenic and phosphorus to dope it N type uh, and boron to dope it P type right. And uh, of course, you would need oxide because we have been talking about uh, FET structure you need a silicon oxide as a gate insulator and also you would need oxide for isolation and so on and so forth right. And once you complete your transistors you need to connect them so you would certainly have aluminum as an interconnect layer right. And you know hydrogen is a lightest element no matter what uh, you do you will always have hydrogen and it turns out we also intentionally introduce hydrogen in our silicon technology uh, to do what is called uh, surface passivation of silicon. In other words when you put oxide on silicon you see it is a it is a system of two different materials when you go from one material to the other material at the interface you have a lot of defects right. By having hydrogen out there hydrogen can passivate these defects which are essentially dangling bonds of silicon which are unterminated bonds and uh, hydrogen would uh, minimize the defects which is extremely important in a field effect transistor because interface is the key in a FET device right. And you know once you complete your chip you passivate that chip with what is called a silicon nitride and hence you will have also nitrogen in it and you when you put it in package you will probably have gold wires uh, connecting the silicon pads onto the package pins right. So, this was very simple just handful of materials were ingredients of your silicon chip. However, the world has changed completely now you know if you were to ask the same question what is the ingredient of a silicon chip today you will see you know a plethora of materials in uh, uh, state of the art silicon chip today right. As an example for example you know in addition to the doping materials which were phosphorus and arsenic we are also using antimony as a doping material right. We are also using indium as a doping material right and uh, you know for metallization we are using a variety of materials as well for example copper is replacing aluminum right. So, Similarly, there are reasons why we introduce a variety of materials. In fact, it is fair to say that we are sort of digging through the periodic table. It is sort of an exploration in periodic table to really build nano electronics chips. In fact, as you know the course is titled nano electronics devices and materials. In fact, as we go on in future lectures we will also understand why some of these materials are being introduced right. This is very crucial right. So, an appreciation for materials technology is very important. New device structures are also very essential going forward right. This is our you know conventional uh, uh, MOS structure metal oxide uh, semiconductor field effect transistor right. And as I have already mentioned what we have done over the years when we have been scaling the technology is really to you know scale this gate length you know the length between this the distance between the source terminal and the drain terminal that is your uh, gate length. In other words typically in a n channel transistor the source terminal is at ground potential ok and you would be applying your uh, drain voltage which is positive voltage to the drain terminal right. Now, what is happening with scaling is that this drain terminal is coming closer and closer to the source this is what we call a proximity effect right. I mean we need to consider the two dimensional distribution of electric field in other words the drain electric field has started influencing the behavior of the transistor out here even without the gate being there to turn on the transistor meaning ideally when the gate voltage is 0 right your Vg equal to 0 should correspond to very very ideally 0 current, but you never get a 0 current nonetheless very small current should be out there. But because of this proximity effect you have very significant leakage current ok. You know it is becoming harder and harder to turn off a transistor to turn off an FET as we are scaling the dimensions of the FET right. One of the important abstraction if you recall we said transistor is a switch right I mean for it to act as a switch ideally it should have a large on current and very small off current. In other words one of the very important metric of transistor is what we call I on over I off ratio. Ideally we want it to be infinity right meaning I off should be 0 
uh, typically for a given on current. But of course, you know you cannot get uh, infinite on to off current ratio, but traditionally in the past we have been easily getting on to off current ratio which is of the order of 10 power 6 ok a million times uh, on current is a million times more than off current which is a fairly up good abstraction of a switch right. Because when it is on it is con conducting 10 I mean 10 to the 6 times current when it is off right. But now you see this has started coming down ok as we st are starting to move this down you know it could come down as low as 10 to the 3 or even less than that. Now imagine if your on current is only 100 times greater than your off current you know that is not a very good abstraction of a switch you see. So, in other words we need to do something out here something in this transistor structure. So, that we can bring this on to off current ratio back to a reasonable number you know 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 that kind of a thing right. We can do that only by using new device structures and hence as we will go on in the course we will also see how do we engineer these transistors so that we can really get uh, a better transistor right in spite of the fact that we are scaling we are bringing this drain voltage closer to the source terminal right. So, that is a very important challenge that we need to deal with right ok. So, ok right. So, in, in, in addition to all this you know there is something uh, interesting that also comes about in other words when we start scaling these dimensions uh, to nano scale you know some physical properties themselves start changing you see for example, we have been building uh, chips on silicon as I said uh, you know we call it bulk silicon right uh, bulk silicon essentially means that uh, you know you have uh, a fairly thick silicon film ok. Now, today we are talking of uh, building chips in silicon film which could be as thin as of the order of uh, you know less than 50 nanometer you know that is ultra thin film ok. Now, as we start thinning down it further right uh, the properties of this silicon film which is a nano silicon film are no longer the same as the properties of a bulk silicon film right. The physics changes at this nano scale for example, the band gap is no longer the same as the thick silicon film. If the band gap changes obviously, you would expect all the semiconducting properties would change like carrier concentration so on and so forth right. So, that is something that we also need to understand uh, and you know accordingly design of course, you cannot get rid of quantum effects right. The size effect is essentially coming because of quantization, but we will exploit those effects and intelligently devise and design the transistors right. So, that we would be able to scale the technology further ok ok. So, then characterization is also very important right you have made something and you need to really see if you have tried to make a transistor which is 40 nanometer after doing all the processes in your nanofab have you actually got 40 nanometer right you need to do lot of characterization material characterization device characterization and so on and so forth. We will also have quite a bit of discussion in this course on material characterization which includes measuring dimensions right whether it is 40 nanometers 35 nanometers and so on and so forth. Composition if you are making a new material you know what is the composition of that material right we will have uh, techniques to really investigate that right stresses become extremely important right. Uh, you have multiple materials stacked together their uh, you know thermal expansion coefficients are not going to be identical right. So, hence there will be stresses that will be developed in these materials and they, they could have significant impact on the device sometimes detrimental. On the other hand we can also exploit these stresses for our benefit and design devices intelligently as we will see later right we actually do strain engineering and uh, uh, you know get better devices right. And of course, you know in terms of uh, uh, IV characterization eventually your electrical property is what is important when you use it in circuits right. So, such as current voltage and capacitance voltage characteristic and reliability of the device will it uh, operate only today or it will uh, sustain uh, all the harsh environments for next 5 to 10 years you know that becomes extremely important right. So, we will have a discussion on all these aspects as well right and uh, ok. Also, when we talk of various uh, processing right, 
you know there are two ways you can approach nano dimension right uh, one is what is called uh, top down approach that is you start from uh, uh, large dimensions and start etching materials that you do not want and bring it down to the nano scale right. So, that is what we call a uh, top down or shrink down approach okay which is also sometimes called subtractive approach because you are trying to get rid of films that you do not want and the key enabler here is photolithography right using uh, that we create these devices. There is another uh, approach that chemists have been working on this kind of approach you bring atoms together and you get a new product right uh, that is uh, assembling the atoms right from the atomic scale you can reach the nano dimension right. So, these are the two ways you can uh, arrive at nano devices. But as of today you know we have no clue yet although there is lot of research going on in uh, figuring out uh, how to really uh, create technologies the so called self assembly technology to create nano devices. If we do that that would really be disruptive technology biology builds the network big systems like that right. But all the technology that we have been building is essentially shrink down technology right. So, all the processes that we are going to discuss in this uh, course is only going to be restricted on this okay. There may be a very brief mention on um, you know a self assembly kind of technologies right. So, that you know you know where we are heading hmm? okay and you know the, these uh, devices these chips are essentially made in uh, facilities that are called uh, nano fabrication facility right which is essentially a clean room right. Clean room means that you know this is an area where we have extremely fine control on environmental parameters right. The environmental parameters include the dust particle in that room okay. For example, we say that a clean room typically is a class 100 or class 10 clean room. What it means is that in that if it is a class 100 clean room if I take 1 cubic foot of air volume in that room and if I start counting particles of size 0.5 micron and above I should not count more than 100 particles then it qualifies as class uh, uh, 100 clean room. Just to give you a a proper context a typical air conditioned uh, office room may be class uh, 1 million room meaning you will easily count a million particles right. So, you will have to go through a very elaborate uh, process to filter out all that and create a clean environment right. And in addition there will be very strict uh, temperature and humidity consideration right. This is important because only when you do that you will get very high yield. What we mean by yield here is if I make 1000 chips out of 1000 how many are working chips right uh, that is what we mean by yield 100 percent yield is what we always aim for right. If you have uh, defects for example, if you have uh, dust particles if they sit on your silicon wafers obviously you will not get that chip uh, in that location as a working chip right. So, that is as simple as that right ok. So, this ends to just uh, uh, set the expectations uh, for this course you will gain a very thorough understanding of uh, CMOS scaling issues. Uh, in fact, uh, we will get started on uh, CMOS scaling uh, immediately after this slide and uh, you will also understand the state of the art process flow. How does one put together different semiconductor processes in other words what is called process integration to be able to create a state of the art CMOS technology right. You will also understand that through this course. And uh, you will also understand why do we need new materials and device structure. I have already mentioned that very briefly, but uh, we will take several cases and uh, explain why do you need this right. And you will also have a fairly good knowledge on design techniques to be able to do what is called a non classical CMOS transistor. Meaning, remember the device structure I showed you earlier uh, a simple uh, uh, source drain and gate structure that is what we call a classical transistor which has really worked for last 4 decades or so. Now, we are talking of non classical CMOS transistors right. So, we will also uh, have a fairly good idea on um, you know uh, understanding the design techniques for that and uh, hopefully, you will also gain fairly good expertise in material synthesis and characterization through this course right. So, this is what uh, we aim uh, for through this course ok. So, then uh, let us get started uh, uh, with the the scaling uh, ok. 
and again here we are looking at uh, uh, CMOS technology scaling. Okay. Okay. So, you know uh, you should uh, look at this uh, uh, paper uh, sometime uh, you know this is of course available uh, IEEE archives uh, which was published in Journal of Solid State Circuits in 1974. This is a very classic paper right which is being referred uh, whenever you talk of scaling. Okay. This was uh, you know published by a group uh, headed by Dennard at IBM way back in 1974 and this was essentially titled as design of ion implanted MOSFETs with very small physical dimensions. Right? This was as you know published in general of solid state circuits uh, and uh, essentially through this paper uh, the authors present certain guidelines uh, for scaling and also sort of explain why do you want uh, to scale the CMOS technology. Okay? So, let us uh, try to understand that. Okay? Now, there are different kinds of scaling, uh, but when you go through that paper you come across this term called constant electric field scaling. Okay? This is the key word here constant electric field scaling. So, what this scaling uh, uh, theory this is what we call ideal scaling theory for constant electric field scaling of CMOS technology. Okay? So, what it says is that you have a transistor at any given time let us say this is the state of the art technology right does not matter what dimensions are right it has certain uh, gate length it has certain source drain junction depth and so on and so forth. Okay? And now you want to come up with a new generation of technology and that new generation of technology will have a same MOSFET except that it is a miniaturized version of this transistor a smaller transistor. Okay? So, this is what we call a technology scaling starting from a bigger transistor to a smaller transistor and we define a scaling factor called k which is greater than 1. Okay? Now, this constant electric field scaling theory provided three fundamental uh, guidelines right? which is what we call primary scaling factors or primary scaling guidelines. Okay. It says that given a transistor that you want to scale in future you scale all linear dimensions all linear dimension no matter which area of the transistor that you are looking at by a factor 1 over k. Okay, right? In other words if your transistor has a channel length L okay, here this transistor will have a channel length which is L divided by k that is what we mean by you know scaling it by 1 over k right since k is greater than unity the length has come down right in a new transistor by that scaling factor k right it turns out that you know traditionally we have used uh, uh, scaling factor which is about 1.4 okay from one technology generation to other technology generation in other words 1 over k is approximately 0 0.7 uh, it also becomes clear in a minute why we use that okay you see oxide thickness essentially this is your transistor and this is your uh, gate insulator right that is oxide thickness T ox that should also come down here by the same factor length we already talked about and the transistor has a width right in other direction right. So, the width should also scale down by the same uh, uh, amount right. So, that is uh, another important uh, parameter to uh, think about. Okay, uh, let us see here. Okay. So, let us consider this transistor here, uh, right? Let us say we restrict our discussion for the time being to n channel transistor, right. So, this is SiO2 okay, and this is your uh, gate electrode okay, which typically is polycrystalline silicon although it has changed now we are talking of metal gate transistors today. 
okay and this transistor you know will extend in this direction right uh, because this is what we call a width of the transistor correct okay so uh, whereas this is the length of your transistor right so the length will scale down by that factor and this is what we already said is t ox right oxide thickness will also scale down so t ox goes as t ox over k and the same thing happens to length width and also the junction depth this is what we call x j which is your junction depth. So, the junction depth will also scale down in a new transistor. So, all linear dimensions will scale down by that factor. So, that is the first point of the scaling theory right. The second point of the scaling theory is that the supply voltage okay, also scales down by the same factor okay, just as your linear dimensions all your linear dimensions have gone down right as 1 over k. Hmm? The supply voltage will also go down 1 over k. Now, now you understand why is it called constant electric field scaling theory right because if your voltages are going down by a same factor distances are going down by the same factor right as a result of that your electric field which is essentially voltage divided by any distance is invariant in your original transistor and a new transistor right. So, that is the idea behind constant electric field scaling theory. Now, there is a third scaling guideline which is very interesting because in order to satisfy constant electric field scaling theory it appears that these two guidelines are more than sufficient right. But the third guideline says your doping concentrations uh, should increase by a factor k okay. Hmm. That is all linear dimensions and supply voltages are coming down however, your doping should go up okay in a new transistor okay now for example what doping are we talking about this is anyway n plus meaning it's degeneratively doped very close to the atomic density of silicon so there is not much we can do there we are really talking about what is called a substrate doping this is p type substrate hmm, in which we have made a n channel transistor the doping concentration here which is designated as na which is acceptor impurities that we have in the transistor that should go up in a new transistor as k times n a ok. Now, if you think about it if you think about it uh, this really comes about because of the fact that this linear dimension you see all linear dimension, but for one linear dimensions are defined by us using photolithography process like the length of the transistor you print the length of the transistor width of the transistor you are printing the width of the transistor and so on and so forth right. The uh, junction depth you control by how long you do the diffusion right, but there is one very important parameter which is what we call a depletion width right. There is a p n junction here p n plus p junction which is what we call a one sided junction right which is n plus and this is lightly doped p region. And there is always going to be certain depletion width here you see this depletion width let us denote as w suffix d depletion width ok that is a width of the depletion region. You see this is also a linear dimension right if the scaling guideline the first guideline is to scale all linear dimension we should also enable the scaling of the depletion width right. So, how do you enable the scaling of the depletion width you see for the one sided depletion uh, junction the depletion width is essentially given by this expression right this is the expression for depletion width for one sided junction right epsilon silicon encompasses the free uh, permittivity as well as the free space permittivity right. So, it is epsilon r times epsilon naught right that is the permittivity of silicon and v is the voltage across that uh, depletion region and n a is the doping concentration when we talk of one sided junction we are talking of doping concentration in a lightly doped junction region of the junction ok. Now, you see this v is scaling as 1 over k remember that the scaling guideline has already told us to scale v as 1 over k. Now, if I scale this n a as k times n a right you see then what happens in a new transistor is that you get k square under root here right q n a k square. Okay, because you are increasing n a and you are decreasing v by the same factor which is k. In other words 
your new transistor will now have a depletion width which is k times smaller than the previous transistor right and hence you have been able to scale all linear dimensions consistently as per the requirement of a constant electric field scaling theory right. So, this is essentially the basis for the constant electric field scaling theory. Now, something very interesting comes out if you follow these three primary guidelines right. Now, let us first do what is called derived device behavior ok. If you follow that guideline what happens to the device behavior? We are now looking at uh, four important device behaviors here right. One is electric field we already said electric field is invariant it does not scale it remains same right previous electric field multiplied by 1 gives the new electric field correct. Voltage is important metric for a device we know voltage is scaling as V over K ok because of that your current will also scale over as sorry I over K ok. Hmm? Now, one other very important parameter for device is a capacitance in fact that is the most important parameter when we talk of CMOS circuits. What is capacitance you see capacitance is again epsilon naught epsilon r times A divided by distance between uh, you know whether it is depletion capacitance or a parallel plate capacitance it does not matter ok. Now, let us think about what happens to the device capacitance what is its scaling behavior right. A is area which has two linear dimensions in the numerator and D is also one linear dimension in the denominator. In other words A goes down as 1 over k square and D goes down as 1 over k effectively your C will go down as 1 over k. So, your C goes down as C over K. Hmm? In a new device, capacitance decreased. You see, capacitance is like inertia for these devices. If your inertia goes down, these transistor will start switching faster and faster. You know, that is the key. We will find out that in a minute in what is called derived circuit behavior, right. Now, with this background, let us look at uh, the circuit behavior, right. If I follow this, what happens to your circuit? Okay. When we talk of CMOS circuit, we should envision the CMOS circuit as capacitive circuits you see. For example, let me show you a very simple the simplest CMOS circuit which is an inverter okay, which has a P channel transistor and an N channel transistor connected in series. Okay. This is VDD, this is your P MOS and this is your N channel transistor and this is your output. Okay and this is your input ok. You see this is an inverter right that is when your input is high output is low and you know vice versa ok. But the figure of metric for us is not the steady state how long does it take to switch from one state to the other state that is your switching speed that in turn will determine your circuit speed right. Any complex circuit whether it is microprocessor or memory is all you know large number of such smaller circuits aggregated together you see. So, the switching speed is very important. Now, when we talk of switching speed remember this circuit is going to drive a next stage of a CMOS circuit right does not matter what that is it could be a similar inverter or it could be a NAND gate or you know so on and so forth. In other words when we look at the input of any CMOS circuit we need we essentially see a gate capacitance right. We see a capacitive input right because it is going to the gate insulator here uh, FET right. So, you know you have capacitance here this capacitance really has to be switched between 0 and supply voltage depending on when I am switching it from 0 to VDD or VDD to 0 ok. In other words if my input goes from 0 to VDD ok then my output should go from VDD to 0. Okay, this is what I want to be able to do in CMOS circuit right. But you know there is going to be if I were to do it in a time axis if this is my input and this is my output if this input goes up at time t equal to 0 you know my output will have certain latency right it will not in switch instantaneously right and this is a very crucial parameter which is typically called propagation delay. Hmm. We say that in CMOS circuit the propagation delay which we also sometimes write as tau, tau is given by a metric called C v over i ok. 
where C is the capacitance that you are switching at any node in a CMOS circuit, V is the voltage that uh, that capacitance needs to be switched uh, you know as I said between uh, 0 to VDD or VDD to you know uh, uh, ground as I mentioned already. And uh, then uh, you know I is a current that is available for you to charge and discharge this capacitor. In other words, for this to go from output to go from high to low right output was high you see output was high how will it go to 0? It will go to 0 only by discharging that node through this transistor which is sitting down otherwise you cannot uh, bring it down right. And that happens because you have made this input high earlier when it was low P channel was on and hence your output was pulled up to VDD right. Now, I have switched off the P channel transistor. But capacitance still has that charge you see that needs to be discharged unless you do that you would not go to 0. So, this transistor will draw out that charge and hence the current in this transistor decides what is the time it takes uh, to discharge that right. Larger the current you have quicker is it to discharge and hence the discharge time is inversely proportional to current. Larger the capacitance more is the charge stored and hence it takes longer. Similarly, larger the voltage more is the charge stores it takes longer to discharge the capacitor right. So, you know this is in fact you know q times i has a dimension of time right you know it is dimensionally consistent also right. Now, this is what is the key right. Now, given this background let us now see tau is C v over i this is my delay. I know that C is scaling as C over k, V is scaling over V over k and i is scaling over i over k. So, what does it mean? Your delay goes down as k, right? This is amazing, right? What it tells you is that you do not even have to redesign any circuit. You take a circuit today, it could be as I said, a simple inverter or a more complex microprocessor, which is on a 90 nanometer technology. Without even redesigning, you scale it down to 65 nanometer technology, immediately your circuit starts operating faster, okay. Of course, when you go to a new generation of technology, you do lot of circuit engineering, redesign and also lot of system level architecting and hence your speed benefit is much more than what technology gives. But this is one of the very important reason why you want to scale the technology, circuit starts operating faster. But that is not the end of the story you see. In circuits, speed is one important metric and power is another important metric which is V times I. Okay. So, what will happen to power V is scaling as V over K, I is scaling as I over K, power is scaling as P over K square right. This is even even better right. The, the, the circuit which was operating earlier at certain frequency now operates at much higher frequency, but consuming significantly lower amount of power ok. So, why would you not want to do a scaling of a technology right. Uh, so, that is why there has been a phenomenal push towards scaling technology right. So, in fact, we sort of capture this whole thing based on what is called a power delay product ok, which is essentially P times tau you know power times delay has you know the dimension of energy you see ok. Now, what will happen to power delay product? Power is going over 1 over k square, delay is going over 1 over k. In other words, power delay product goes as 1 over k cube, right? k is greater than 1. Huh? So, what it tells you is the following, right? Energy consumed to perform any given operation, okay, is going down as k cube just by scaling the device dimension, okay. So, this is uh, you know very good right this is great actually and that is why we have been uh, scaling the technology. And of course, what happens to the circuit density right what is circuit density the circuit density is essentially your number of transistor that you can pack per unit area correct this is your circuit density right density of the circuit. So, what happens to that? Uh, remember A goes as 1 over k squared and that k square comes to the numerator right. So, your circuit density goes up as k square right. In other words, you are able to pack more number of devices 
in a given area compared to what you were doing earlier right ok. So, this is this is what is very important to understand and, and also mentioned uh, some time uh, uh, some uh, ago that typically when we are scaling the technology right the technology 1 to a technology new technology right we have used a scaling factor which is 0 0.7 which is 1 over k ok k is 1 over 0 0.7 ok I mentioned that you know a while ago right. So, you may wonder why why do we use this uh, factor 0 0.7 right. The idea of using this uh, factor 0 0.7 is the following right you know eventually you are building a chip right. Hmm? You are going to scale the dimensions by a factor 0 0.7 ok. In other words this dimension length and width both will come down as 0 0.7 in other words the area here is 50 percent lower than the area here right because this is 0 0.7 if this is x and this is x if it is square this is 0.7 x and this is 0.7 x. So, what you got here in terms of area is 0.49 x square as opposed to x square here right. So, that is a very good metric for scaling you have a chip you have reduced that area by 50 percent right ok. If you want to reduce it very significantly you may ask the question why not 0 0.3 you know 0 0.3 is is, a, is is like a you know jumping a big step you see we are at one uh, you know 100 nanometer technology and we want to directly go to 30 nanometer technology right May, you know skipping all the intermediary steps you know that is very daunting task you know it is al almost impossible to do that. If you want to do that we may want to wait for 10 years right it does not make sense in this fast uh, pace of the technology right. On the other hand why not just 0.95 because that gives a very incremental improvement right you have not really scaled the technologies very significantly if you take x and scale it by 0.95 x right whereas you know 0.7 x historically you know we have marched along that path that has been a fairly good uh, scaling number that we have discovered right. So, and and this is what we do right. So, hence the constant electric field scaling theory gives you all these uh, benefits and that is why we would like to scale the technology ok. okay. Right. So, you know if you were to uh, go by that and as I mentioned already you know your delay goes down your power goes down your power delay product goes down your circuit density goes up and so on and so forth right. So, this is uh, a very important uh, consideration ok. But it turns out if we look uh, at the scaling we have not necessarily done constant electric field scaling right uh, for various reasons right. Let me illustrate that uh, to you through this uh, uh, typical scaling scenario right. As I mentioned uh, this paper was uh, published way back in 1974 ok. During that period we had uh, 5 micron technology which was operating at a supply voltage of 10 volt mm. and you know a decade later in 1984 we had something like 1 micron technology ok which operated at a supply voltage of 5 volt right. You can obviously see that we scale the dimension by 5 x, but the voltages were not scaled by 5 x the voltages were scaled by only 2 x right. So, then of course, from 1 micrometer we came down to 0.35 ok, whereas the supply voltage came down from 5 volt to 3.5 volt ok. Again you know it is not the same scaling factor ok. However, here it is very close from 0.35 micrometer which is 350 nanometer we came down to 90 nanometer and the supply voltage came down from 3.5 volt to 1 volt right. I mean it is very close to 0.9 volt right at least here we are very close to constant electric field scaling theory right. Whereas, here in these uh, uh, scenarios we have actually let the electric field go up in the device right and now you know uh, we we are uh, th ok. First of all why why did it happen right uh, there, there was always a resistance to scale voltage because you see eventually you are going to use these chips and build systems right. A system designer would have already designed a system at working at 10 volt right. And 2 years down the line if you come back to the system designer and tell the designer that I have a better chip, but you will have to redesign your entire system to operate at 8 volt you know there will be a lot of resistance from system designer right. So, that is why historically the voltage scaling has been very slow there has always been a resistance to scale voltage as far as possible keep the voltage you know only if it comes to such a bad condition that the device will break down 
it will not operate. See what, why, okay, first of all, why do you want to scale uh, voltages? Because if you do not scale voltages, your electric fields in the device will be so large that you will have the device breakdown taking place, right. Of course, you cannot let the volt voltages uh, be stay at the same time, right, at the same value all along. Voltages have scaled as long as they satisfy the reliability consideration, they have not scaled beyond that, right. They have just pegged the voltage that is adequate, right, right, accordingly 3.5, 1 volt and so on and so forth, right. And that is why we define a few other scaling scenarios that are called constant voltage scaling in which case this is another extreme right you do not scale the voltage from the current generation of technology to the new generation of the technology right which means all linear dimensions are scaled voltage is not scaled. If you do not scale the voltage you want to scale all linear dimension your doping concentration has to go up by k square correct okay based on whatever we worked out earlier right. If you do that in your device the electric field will go up by this factor k drain current will go up, capacitance of course will come down because all linear dimensions have been scaled and capacitance is only a function of linear dimension. Okay. Your delay of course goes down much faster 1 over k square as opposed to constant electric field scaling theory where the delay was decreasing only as 1 over k. Okay. Your circuit is little more faster you know that is also another good thing if your circuit becomes fast and withstands uh, the reliability constraint then you are ok, you do not necessarily have to scale the voltage right. However, the flip side is that your power you know will go up ok, your power delay product will not scale as efficiently as it used to earlier ok right. So, these are other issues right, uh, this is uh, circuit density of course will improve no, no matter what right, because you are scaling the linear dimension and circuit density will go up ok. So, but as I mentioned we have neither done constant electric field scaling theory nor done constant voltage scaling, uh, uh, but instead what we have actually done is something called generalized scaling ok. Here what we say is that we introduce one more parameter called alpha ok. We have a linear dimension scaling factor which is k all linear dimensions are scaled by the same factor k ok. Your supply voltage is scaled as alpha divided by k. Okay. Now, when uh, <coughs> alpha is equal to k you know it is a constant voltage scaling theory right otherwise uh, you know it is a constant you know for different values of alpha between the extreme you go between electric field and voltage uh, constant voltage scaling and in between we call it is a generalized scaling right. Voltages are scaled, but not as aggressively as the scaling in linear dimensions ok. So, again you can go through the math that we did earlier you see that the electric fields are going up ok by a factor alpha ok, but not as much as constant voltage scaling theory in which case it would have gone up by k where here alpha is less than k ok. IDS go scales as this capacitance will scale as this and your delay will go down as this as I mentioned already right when alpha is equal to 1 it is ele constant electric field scaling when alpha is equal to k it is constant voltage scaling theory right. So, you know that is what we have done we have really done what is called a more uh, a generalized uh, scaling ok. okay. Now, this is all fine uh, when we are talking of what is called uh, idealized uh, uh, scaling right, but you see there are certain uh, uh, parameters uh, that we call are non scaling. Let us start with band gap of silicon right. The band gap of silicon is 1.12 electron volt right whether you know your transistor has a gate length of 1 micron or 0.5 micron your band gap of silicon does not change right and uh, you know that is a very important uh, parameter right. Now, why is it important? It turns out band gap is important because this in turn will determine what is going to be your bulk potential ok. You dope silicon you introduce certain number of impurities your Fermi level in silicon will change ok and that is what we call a bulk potential a intrinsic silicon has a 0 bulk potential you convert it to p type or n type and Fermi level will go down if it is p type below mid gap if it is n type it will go above the mid gap right and that is the bulk potential right and that bulk potential also depends on what is your band gap right and uh, uh, 
your intrinsic carrier concentration depends on band gap right. So, there are a lot of uh, device parameters which are governed by band gap right, right. So, they, they will remain invariant they do not really scale right and uh, thermal voltage you see this is also another important uh, parameter. What is thermal voltage essentially it is k t over q right k is Boltzmann constant q is the electron charge and t is the absolute temperature. You see if your chip commercial chips most of the commercial chips are spec to operate between minus 40 degree centigrade to plus 125 degree centigrade right that is your typical operating temperature of your chip right. Whether you do a chip in a you know 350 nanometer technology or 65 nanometer technology it is going to the same application right and hence this operating range is not going to change. As a result of that the temperature remains same you know the temperature of operation is not changing. So, k t over q does not change right. Again this has very significant implication as we will see little later right because this k t over q among other things it determines one very important uh, uh, metric of a device and that is called sub threshold slope ok. okay. This sub threshold slope uh, will determine what is the leakage current of a transistor ok. So, this is a very important parameter in fact, we will see that one of the reason why the on, uh, on current to off current ratio is degrading as I mentioned earlier is because your leakage current increasing and that is because your sub threshold slope is invariant you are decreasing the threshold voltage, but the sub threshold slope is not changing and hence you have very large leakage current right. We will we will talk about that later ok. Mobility degradation ok we made a very uh, uh, simplistic uh, uh, assumptions earlier we said that voltage scales as one v over k current will scale as v over k. Okay. But in reality you know what is the current that we are talking about the current that we are talking about is a MOSFET current right uh, you know a MOSFET current for example, if it is in a saturation region then it is essentially given by you know expression which would look something like this right ok. Where this is what we call the mobility uh, ok. So, now if you were to uh, uh, see this uh, 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 you know what we mentioned uh, a while ago right uh, uh, this mobility we have assumed is not going to change ok. The mobility will remain uh, uh, constant ok. First of all now ok let us verify if mobility were to be constant whether this is indeed the case right. Remember this C ox here is a per unit area capacitance ok. In other words this C ox here is epsilon ox epsilon naught divided by T ox ok. That is the C ox, C ox is not the total capacitance here ok. Now you see T ox scales as 1 over k. So, 1 over k, k will come to the numerator all voltages we have said scale as 1 over k right. There is a square term here voltage square term right. So, hence you will have a 1 over k square term here in the denominator right. So, in other words your ideal scaling rule will be k coming from C ox in the numerator k square coming in the denominator because of V g minus V t square term you see and that is how we said V scales or uh, by this dimension and I will also scale as I over k uh, that assumes that mobility is not scaling you see, but that is no longer true mobility is also getting affected and why is that because the scaling theory told us to increase the doping concentration you see we had this transistor right this is the source and this is the drain and this is my p type region which is doped with certain impurity concentration. When the electrons are travelling in this channel to reach the drain terminal and contribute to your drain current they get scattered because of the presence of impurities in this channel and that is what is called the impurity scattering and impurity scattering has a significant impact on the mobility of a transistor right on in general carrier mobility. As I started increasing the doping concentration here as dictated by the scaling guideline I had to do that you see 
my mobility will degrade in the channel right because these carriers will start seeing more impurity atoms and as a result of that your mobility is no longer constant right we had implicitly made this assumption that mobility is constant and hence v scales as v over k i will scale as i over k right so these are the secondary effects that we need to worry about okay when we actually look at a practical device there is also another issue of velocity saturation you see and this is also you know something uh, very important uh, issue that uh, we need to uh, address and that essentially okay if you look at electric field versus velocity curve in any semiconductor you know it will look like this remember what is mobility your velocity is your mobility times electric field okay and this is that proportionality constant mobility right so hence v versus e is expected to be linear but every material has a, a what is called a saturation velocity the velocity the maximum velocity the carriers can attain in that given material for example in silicon the saturation velocity is about 10 to the 7 centimeter per second okay okay and typically this saturation velocity we attain this saturation velocity at electric field such as 10 to the 4 volt per centimeter okay 10 kilo volt per centimeter kind of electric field you start departing from this linear relationship okay now why is this important because remember this transistor that we said n plus n plus and this is my length okay the electric field in this lateral direction where the carriers are conducting right and this is the electric field which is accelerating the carriers and they are attaining certain velocity okay this electric field is increasing as i said because we have not been following constant electric field scaling theory if we have this electric field approaching this region okay then you know your current really does not respond to the voltage beyond certain point right you are increasing the voltage but you are already in this regime carriers cannot attain any higher velocity right so your you know current will not really uh, increase right in other words you will have current saturation even before the pinch off condition typically in a mosfet you get a current saturation only when you reach a pinch off condition in other words if you were to look at ids versus uh, you know uh, vds right so you have this kind of a behavior right this is a linear region and this is a saturation region right and you can transition from a linear region to saturation region when you have a pinch off condition correct now if you have a velocity saturation which takes place even before pinch off has occurred you are increasing the voltage current is increasing but now you have saturated the velocity of the carriers current can no longer increase beyond this point okay so you have an early saturation of the velocity and hence your current gets impacted okay so this is another important effect that we have to address we have to look at the device and ask the question are we operating the device in velocity saturation regime if so we will have to use different set of equations to describe the device behavior right so it will no longer be a quadratic uh, behavior between uh, drain current uh, to the gate to source voltage right so that is also another uh, important uh, uh, parameter to consider right so the other thing of course is uh, the parasitic source and drain resistance okay again you see when we talked about the transistor right this is the source and drain region okay and this is your gate mm. by applying gate voltage you are only controlling this channel eventually we will have a metal contact which will be coming in the source and drain region somewhere out here with a proper distance maintained between the gate edge and this contact if you do not maintain this proper edge you may have a danger of this contact shorting gate and the drain or gate and the source right you need to have an appropriate distance right now what it means is the following right i am applying a ground potential to the source terminal which means at the metal contact 
okay. I am applying a drain voltage out here again at the metal contact right because this transistor sitting you remember sitting all the way down in your uh, uh, hierarchy of the interconnects and silicon that we looked at uh, in the last class right. So, the, the supply is applied out there if it is metal file that is where I am applying the drain voltage and the ground potential and that signal will have to come down all the way down to the silicon although in that case fortunately we can ignore all the metal resistances right for all practical purpose. But you see this resistance out here it is no, no longer a metal right it is a highly doped silicon and this is what we call a parasitic resistance right. In other words I have a gate control only in the channel region if you were to write an equivalent model for this transistor then your equivalent model for your transistor would look something like this. This is your drain voltage this is your gate voltage and this is your idealized transistor but then you have a parasitic source resistance and a parasitic drain resistance which is which should not be there ideally right because eventually if this parasitic resistance is large then it can impact the entire transistor uh, behavior right. Now is it becoming large yes right why is it becoming large you see we have decreased these junction depths the junction depth is coming down and you know the current that is coming out here in the channel has to flow through this region with decreasing junction depth that resistance has also increased phenomenally right. So, that is also another important consideration uh, and of course, we do something very intelligent to overcome all this right. Uh, this is what you can understand why do we need new materials you know how do we bring this resistance back to where it should be and so on and so forth right. So, that is something that uh, you need to uh, keep in mind ok. Uh, okay. Then uh, the last one uh, is what we call a process tolerance uh, you know we will not really uh, discuss quite a bit uh, about this uh, in this course, but what it uh, tells you is the following right. If you are talking about a circuit right you are making printing manufacturing large number of transistors you have this chip as I mentioned there is a transistor sitting here transistor sitting here and so on and so forth. Let us suppose that you have designed these transistors to be identical transistor with W is equal to let us say 0.5 micrometer and L is equal to let us say 100 nanometer or 0.1 micrometer ok. But when you actually fabricate this transistor it turns out these transistors if you were to measure electrical characteristics they do not come out identical to each other there is what is called a process variation. Huh? When you are trying to print here it may not print exactly 0.5 here it may print as 0.52 and here it may print as 0.49 and here the length may print as 0.11 and here it may be 0.099 uh, you know, uh, or whatever it is right. So, there is going to be variation in the processing that we have there is a process tolerance. Hmm? What is happening is that it is becoming harder and harder for us to make tiny transistor exactly identical to each other. In other words if we were looking at a 1 micron technology and look at any device parameter such as threshold voltage which is a very important parameter for a transistor you will still have a distribution, but the distribution would have looked something like this very tight distribution with very very low standard deviation. On the other hand this is what you would see in a 1 micron transistor. On the other hand in a 90 nanometer technology if you were to look at a VTH distribution you may see a distribution which would look like this right. You have made a million transistor which were supposed to be exactly identical to each other, but they are no longer identical they have actually a huge spread. How do you manage this spread right this is also a very important consideration that uh, one has to keep in mind right. So, this is what we call as uh, some of the uh, parameters which are non scaling and uh, we will have to deal with these parameters appropriately right. But just to sort of uh, summarize and conclude we require scaling because scaling will immediately enhance the circuit performance make the circuit more efficient in terms of speed and consumption of power and so on and so forth. However, there are a lot of issues that will come about because of scaling because the world is not ideal right as we looked at some of the non ideal factors right. We need to be able to design the transistors so that we overcome all these non idealities and still be able to derive all the benefits that were indicated in the beginning in a ideal scaling theory right. We will look at some of these things in the next class.